Next topic is responsible sourcing of gemstones, key factors for industrial survival by Mr. Sean Gilbertson, Executive Director, Gemfield Group Limited. He will live broadcast from the United Kingdom. Hello, Sean. Good morning. Hi. Good morning to you. But right now is good afternoon in Thailand. Okay, so. Please be ready to share your presentation. Are you ready? Yes. You can, can share the presentation on the screen. So right now, I would like to hand over to you, Sean. Thank you very much. And uh, esteemed guests, it's a pleasure and a privilege to speak with you this morning. And if we get that presentation on screen, You should now be able to see that. And a very big thank you also to the organizers for the invitation to speak with you. I've been asked to speak with you today about uh, responsible sourcing of gemstones and key factors for industry or industrial survival. And we've identified five of those which we're going to discuss this afternoon. And of course, we recognize that everybody's experience and therefore their specific key factors will be different. Uh, we hope you will learn something from the five that we've identified, and we certainly look forward to learning from those that you yourselves might identify. Moving on, if we can make the technology work, there we go. Uh, the first key factor for industrial survival is that diversification and scale really do help. But even then, things can go very wrong when significant events like the pandemic come along. At Gemfields, we're very lucky to have a degree of diversification. Uh, we run the Kajum Emerald Mine in Zambia, the Montepuez Ruby Mine in Mozambique or MRM. And then of course, we also own 100% of Fabergé. And that brings about important diversification in different jurisdictions. And hopefully at some point, we'll also be able to add sapphires but even with that diversification and also with that scale, uh, here's what happens when things go wrong. What you're looking at is the total revenue for the Gemfields Group in the preceding 12 months. So each of these are annual figures. The green, unsurprisingly, is Zambian Emerald. The red, unsurprisingly, is Mozambique and Ruby. And the black tips at the top are the Fabergé revenues. And what's obviously very striking here is the impact of COVID-19, during which both of our mining operations had to be stopped for 12 months. And of course, we were unable to run our traditional ruby and emerald auctions, meaning that our revenues uh, collapsed. But fortunately, you can see that in 2021, that diversification and scale has helped us bounce back uh, quite nicely with record revenues to the end of December 2021. The second key factor for industrial survival that we identified was the importance of being transparent. This really aids accountability and obviously also continuous improvement. I also think that if we are honest as an industry, the opacity or the opaqueness of our supply chain has long been a hindering factor. And in terms of that transparency, many of you will be aware that we publish an incredible amount of data, uh, way beyond what we're required to do in terms of stock exchange regulations, so that everybody can see not only the revenues, and this is a summary of all of the auctions that we've held to date. And again, you can see the gap during the COVID pandemic. In fact, Montepuez Ruby Mining or MRM had zero revenue in 2020. We also pioneered something called the G factor for natural resources, which we would call on other participants, particularly mining companies in our industry, but also mining companies outside of our industry to adopt this standard and to start publishing the data. And effectively what we're doing is showing what percentage of the revenue from a mining project ends up going to the host country's government in the form of taxation. So if we look at MRM over the course of the last 10 years, 
you can see approximately $150 million of taxes paid. You can see total revenues, and this was to 31 December 2020, of 590 million. And that means that 26 cents in every dollar of revenue, not profit, has been paid to the Mozambican government from this project. 20 years ago, I don't imagine many people would have expected to see detailed production data uh, from a miner in the colored gemstone space. And we feel that transparency is vitally important. You can see here the total number of carrots produced by the mining operation and indeed by the washing plant. The impact of COVID is very clear, as is the subsequent pickup. But the type of carrots that one produces are critically important. And this is a chart that shows for each of the recent years, the total premium carrots, the ones that really matter, that have been produced by MRM. You can see in the orange line production coming to a halt in March of 2020. And in the red line, you can see the total actual premium ruby production for 2021, namely last year. And interestingly, a number of the years have ended up at between 80 and 90,000 premium ruby carrots. In terms of operating costs, you can see those increasing dramatically over the years. And you can also see the impact of the pandemic in our total rock handling, which had reached 7 million tons before the pandemic and has subsequently come down very significantly. But please note that despite the mining operations stopping for a year, we still had circa $20 million worth of operating costs because it's obviously still very expensive to keep a mine going. And very importantly, of the 1,400 team members that are employed at Montepoise Ruby Mining, nobody was made redundant. In other words, everybody kept their jobs through the pandemic. We also published, for example, the unit costs per premium carat of producing premium rubies. You can see that graph literally went off the charts during the course of the pandemic because we had costs without any production. And in terms of the overall cost per carat, you can see that sitting at about $5 per carat uh, in the preceding 12 month period. From an investment in the mine or capital expenditure perspective, you can see that recently we had been spending approximately $20 million per annum. Again, in order to preserve cash and ensure survival, a hold was put on capital expenditure during the pandemic, and that is now gradually picking up. And of course, we're going to have to spend significant funds in the next year or two to catch up. Moving on to our third key factor for industrial survival, we say that is the adoption of the right philosophy. This train has left the station and we believe that the industry should embrace all of the supply chain audits and in particular get certified. This is the only way that we are going to separate fact from fiction. And I, in 2019, put up a slide very similar to this at the ICA conference where we ask the fundamental question whose gemstones are we dealing with? And we said at the time that the right philosophy for us is that the gems are the birthright of the host nation citizens. And I don't believe that most objective and reasonable people would debate that statement. That means that the gemstones do not belong to artisanal miners. They cannot benefit only the few. They must benefit the many. And indeed, it also means that the gemstones don't belong to mining companies like Gemfields either. Rather, licensed miners, whether they are small or large, should merely be custodians who are acting as, as service providers to the host governments or indeed the host nation citizens to optimize the proceeds and the benefits that can be derived in country from a particular natural resource. And therefore, this is not a debate about large scale or artisanal or small scale, but rather we should be concerned with making the most of the available natural resource, making sure that we optimize the funds that can be generated by that natural resource. And here's the critical point, getting all of that or as much of that as possible to go back into the host nation. And to underline how bad that has been historically in our industry, the Bank of Mozambique makes available some truly staggering data. 
And what you're looking at here is the money that has flowed into Mozambique in the category of ruby, sapphire, and emerald. This data is available online from the Bank of Mozambique's Balance of Payment or BOP data. And remember that the Montepoise deposit was discovered in 2009. Remember also that even cash coming into the country in excess of $10,000 is supposed to be declared by law and then included in this data. This deposit discovered 2009. The data starts in January 2011. Please remember this covers the whole of Mozambique and all of emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. And the total amount of money flowing into Mozambique is null until we hit about September 2013. Gemfields' first auction was in June of 2014. That's this one. And you can then see a number of additional inflows coming into the country until June of 2021 when this data finishes. And the next statistic, um, esteemed guests, I find both remarkable, but also I'm afraid quite disgusting. And that is that if you add up all the monetary inflows for the whole of Mozambique from emeralds, rubies, and sapphires, our single venture, Montepoix Ruby Mining, accounts for 94% of Mozambique's monetary inflows from rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. Now that cannot be right, and it cannot be fair, and it underscores the extent to which Mozambique's emeralds, rubies, and sapphires have been disappearing from the country without doing good inside the country. One of the key reasons for that, and this is a fundamental differentiator insofar as our industry is concerned, is the difference in pricing. Many people will be aware of just how much of the share of revenue comes from a very small proportion of the best quality gemstones. But the truly terrifying thing is the variation in price that we see in this case for rough rubies and corundum from the Montepoise ruby mine. So the least expensive product that we make available is two cents per gram and the most expensive product, more or less, and obviously there have been exceptions to this, uh, approximately $400,000 per gram. That means the price changes 20 million times. I don't think there's any other product like it out there, but the critical observation from this is that one has no way of accurately providing the price of a gemstone. And to stress that point, we don't have anybody inside the Gemfields group who can pick up a ruby and say, here is the correct price. In other words, the way in which gemstones have been exported from host countries at a fraction of their true value is one of the major reasons why these resources have been disappearing from host nations and not providing the appropriate value in country. I said earlier that this train has left the station and there is no doubt one of the biggest risks to the survival of our industry and or its development and improvement is that we must allow the supply chain scrutiny to continue. And in fact, we're currently seeing amazing progress. We have six exercises at the moment ongoing either with major international jewelry brands or indeed with our auction customers who are pursuing inter alia RJC certification. And that is a really important thing for all of us because it allows people to differentiate fact from fiction. And I want to stress that if we don't shift as an industry to a mine of origin model and where we can demonstrate legal exports from host nations at proper international prices, we are going to run into trouble as the world increasingly and rightly focuses on supply chain due diligence issues. And it's only when sufficient money flows into the host nations that we are able to put in place infrastructure that allows us to bring an aspect of sustainability to the local communities in terms of what we're doing. 
I won't run through all of these in details, but from agricultural projects, chicken projects, educational facilities, mobile clinics, support for internally displaced persons during the insurgency, very importantly, vocational training for local villagers who can then get engaged by the mining operation. All of those are critical to ensuring a proper social license to operate and making sure that the gemstones do the right thing within the country. Our fourth factor for industrial survival is to invest in the long-term future of the sector via marketing and advertising. Again, I think many of us will understand that often we're tempted to think only about tomorrow or indeed next week's profits. And my former colleague, Dev Shetty, mentioned this morning the importance for supporting marketing communications. I won't, won't run through all of these, but that runs through traditional marketing and advertising through to masterclasses, which we have the privilege of running with Guild, both in respect of Emerald, plus also with Rubies. We've just finished the publication of the book Sapphire, completing the trilogy for the big three, despite the fact that we don't yet have Sapphires in the stable. And obviously then also styling guides where key opinion leaders, uh, also known as influencers, can help consumers understand how to style their colored gemstones. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, and to address something of an elephant in the room, the, the final key factor for industrial survival is to be resilient in the face of adversity. In other words, to stay the course. Over the years, as Gemfields has developed, we have, of course, encountered many challenges. Some of those are presented on screen. And I discussed many of these at the ICA Congress back in 2019 in Bangkok. But even recently, we see some of these issues coming to light again. Most recently, many of you will be aware that Global Witness put out a report that was focused on Burmese rubies, but then set about obfuscating Burmese rubies with Mozambique rubies. Inter alia, that report said that the MRM project appears to have primarily profited the elite. Shortly thereafter, we saw one well-known industry commentator say that it's sad that both these sources, Burma and Mozambique, are controlled by military generals. How is it possible for anyone to write statements like that when, in fact, Jim Fields, which is listed on two stock exchanges, owns 75% of MRM, and what's more, manages the ruby auctions and controls the flow of the rubies. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you find people talking dirty in dark corners about our industry or indeed about ourselves, I am personally available and at your service. Contact me, contact us, and let's get everybody at the table and have the discussion properly. And I repeat that today, Montepoise Ruby Mining is the number one most responsible supplier of scale of rubies in the world today. If you find people suggesting otherwise, let's have the conversation. I'm personally available to you. And if anybody is alleging any wrongdoing, we would always encourage them to report that to the right local and international authorities, and even better, make the information available online for all to see so that people can form their own judgment. With that, esteemed guests, thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. And I look forward, as soon as all of this uh, virus-related restrictions are over, to being able to shake your hands in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. But I have one more question. Hello, Sean, are you there? Indeed, I, I am. I have one more question for you. Actually, it's not really related to your presentation, but I want to know for myself, okay? Is that possible to answer? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's read, say something first, okay? So I would like to know if you are in the James industry. So for the people like me, the woman like me, my characteristic, what James Stone is suitable for me? 
What wow. do you think? Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, th there is no doubt that um, that is a question best answered by many of my esteemed colleagues who must be in the audience with you. So I'm sure there are people with far greater expertise able to answer the question better than I am. But if I had to take a guess, looking through what is an imperfect medium of uh, uh, the digital sphere, mm -hmm. I would certainly say that um, um, either a beautiful ruby or perhaps uh, a sparkling spinel might do the trick. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Uh, moving on to the next topic of the day, uh, next, Mr. Kramen Sabbart, the president of the International Colorstone Association, will be here for the future prospect of global colorstone industry after COVID-19. Please welcome.